grass, maybe not drinking enough water, um, and partially my own sin. Um, <clears throat> I've been struggling at work and uh, frustrated with some things, um, but everything kind of came down Friday morning. I'm sitting at my table and uh, feeling, feeling down, feeling beat up, feel, maybe even feeling sorry for myself. Uh, so I started praying, and I started uh, just kind of barfing everything out to God. Um, you know, <laughs> that's pretty much it. Um, and I'm sitting there, still not really feeling much better. But I decided, hey, you know, I prayed about it. I'm going to go about my day. So before I get up, I look at my phone again, and I find a message that my wife had sent me. And uh, she reminded me of who she saw I was as a husband and a father. So I sat back down and um, broke down a little bit in some tears. And I was like, wow, I needed to hear that. Thank you, God. I went in and gave her a hug, kissed goodbye, and thanked her. And then I drove down the road, headed to work, feeling better about myself, a little bit, trying to go, all right, I got this. It's Friday. Come on. Then a song comes on the radio um, that I've heard many times. It's by Lauren Diego. But the words hit me a little harder this morning, <clears throat> and I'm going to read the lyrics to you. It starts off, you are not hidden. There's never, there's never been a moment you were forgotten. Ooh, started hitting me right there. Wow, God. There's never been a moment that you've been forgotten. You are not hopeless. Though you have been broken, your innocence stolen, I hear you whisper underneath your breath. I hear your SOS. I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night. It is true. I will rescue you. I was reminded right there what God thought about me. So I was excited. I was thankful. I'm like, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Follow me. There, <clears throat> I got three points I'm going to get to. Later in my day, a coworker hits me up. Haven't, <clears throat> haven't, an ex coworker, I should say. Haven't talked to him in probably six months. Um, and he hasn't, I haven't worked with him for almost nine years. I worked with him for about five years. But he said, hey, I want to see you today. I said, okay. Yeah, here's where I'm at. Come on by. So he comes by. We end up talking for about 30 minutes. And through that conversation, he said, hey, there was a time when I worked for you that you had a really hard decision you had to make. And I did. <clears throat> See, I had, to take, I had to remove him from a position that, that, that he was holding highly. It was, it was part of who he was. And he, had, he didn't have much growing up, didn't have a father. And I knew that he looked to me as a, as a mentor. And this was a hard decision because I knew it was going to hurt his self-esteem. But I had to make, make it. And he sat here and told me, I know that was a hard decision for you. But you know what? You know what I've learned in nine years? And he went over all these things. And he said, I'm a better man today because of the decision you, you made. And I said, wow. Amen. I said, you're right. That was a hard decision. And you know what? I sat in, in my yard in, in our, off, or our, our work yard waiting for him to come back that evening. And I said, and I prayed. I prayed that day. And I said, I heard God. I said, I don't, I don't hear an audible voice. I said, but he laid on my heart that he said, everything you just told me was the reason he gave me to give to you. So it was a full circle. And we, it was awesome just to be in that moment. So three points I, I learned on my Friday from my week. One, <clears throat> God wants to hear your deepest inner thoughts 
concerns and prayers. And two, trust him. Trust him always. You are not hidden and you are not forgotten. He has you. And three, if you're willing and you repent from your sins and you are humble, he will use you as an influence like he did to me to someone else. Amen, church? Amen. Amen. <clears throat> church, we are less than a month away from the weekend to remember. <clears throat> and being used and influenced, yes, this marriage has made a, this marriage retreat and conference and ministry has made a huge impact on me and my wife. If you want to hear more, ask us. Ask our kids. It's more than just a marriage ministry. It's something that will change your marriage and impact your kids and your family for generations. Please, come see me. I'd love to share more with you and give you a discount. <clears throat> so, also women's Bible study. Back to candies this week. Yeah. Yes, got it right. Okay, 130. And also, if you don't know, we have, they do the same book on Sunday mornings at 915 here at the church. Um, also, if you haven't filled out the surveys, they will be due on the 20th. So please fill the surveys out about Bible study. Um, and then this upcoming Saturday, the 19th, um, I don't have a time, but we are having a baby shower for Amanda. Two? Two o'clock here. All right. <clears throat> um, lastly, uh, youth group, six o'clock tonight, and the kids are dismissed, and I will ask the offertorians to come up, and we will pray for our offering and our day. <clears throat> Father God, we want to give you the glory. Lord, we want to be real with you. We want to lay it all out. We want to be used by you, Lord. Please humble us. Help us seek your face through our trials, Lord. And um, so that we can glorify your kingdom, Lord. We ask you to accept our offerings this morning, Lord, and multiply them for your kingdom and that we can do things in your name, Lord. We praise you in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. amen. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Call for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain. Fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. Here I raise my Ebenezer, here by thy great help I've come, and I hope by thy good pleasure safely to arrive at home jesus sought me when a stranger wandering from the fold of god he to rescue me from danger interposed his precious blood Oh, to grace, how great a debtor Daily I'm constrained to be Let thy goodness, like a fetter Bind my wandering heart to thee Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it Prone to leave the God I love Here's my heart, oh, take and
and seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Oh, that day when freed from sinning, I shall see thy lovely face clothed then in blood-washed linens how i'll sing thy sovereign grace come my lord no longer tarry take my ransom soul away send thine angels now to carry me to realms of endless day come my lord no longer tarry take my ransom soul away send thine angels now to carry me to realms of endless day let's pray father god you who are everything you're the giver of life lord lord you are here for each and every one of us all we have to do is turn towards you and speak your name Lord. and you come you were there Lord help us to remember that each and every moment of the day that it is you that gives us breath gives us life and that you are the way here on this earth Lord so that we can be forever and ever with you in eternity. Lord, we cling to that promise and that hope, Lord. And we just thank you so much for being our God and meeting us here every Sunday and every morning we wake up, Lord. And we uh, just thank you again and again in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we lift up our hands, we meet us here as we call on your name will you meet us here we have come to this place to worship you god of mercy and grace it is you we adore it is you Praises are for only you, the heavens declare, it is you, it is you. Holy, holy is our God Almighty. meet us here as we call on your name will you meet us here we have come to this place to worship you god of mercy and grace it is you we adore it is you Praises are for only you, the heavens declare, it is you, 
head if you will. Holy, holy is our God Almighty. Holy, holy is His name alone. Yeah. Holy, holy is our God Almighty. Holy, holy is His name alone. As we lift up our hands, as we call on Your name, will You visit this place by Your mercy and grace? As we lift up our Unending 
Richard, you ready to give us your word? Nope. Nope. <laughs> Deidre. Yes. That's Thank right. you. That's all right. I just threw myself in there, but I did ask for permission. Very good. <laughs> Thank Very you, good. Pastor. Oh, man. Where's Steve? Whoo. I don't talk to him during the week. I have no communication with him. But the, everything you said, if you guys knew, I'll, I'll never go to hell because I've suffered hell on earth. It's bad enough. This week was a living hell for me. On my job, I got, you know how, how they say you got thrown under the bus? I got thrown under the bus under the ground by a lie at work. Did I handle it like a godly woman? Mm. I was cussing at work to my boss, to the owner of the company, and to the people who came to me, and I told them it was a lie. It, it really, really quickly, uh, there were big orders that hadn't gone out early in the morning, and so somebody went and said, well, that's because Deidre holds all her large orders to the end of the day. So I confronted her about the lie. They even went on the computer not to check me out, but to prove to her she was lying. Uh, what I did, I held big orders to the end of each cart so I wouldn't lose my rhythm doing the smaller orders. I was very disgusted and discouraged. I couldn't understand how anybody could lie on me who I had defended ever since she's been there for the things she said and done. And then we had an opportunity on the phone to talk to the man who was shot in the head twice who was going to testify that Darren had nothing to do with the crime. That man got on that phone. I'm not even going to repeat over the air what he said. Everything I had in me was gone. I lost it all. I was numb. I could not believe he got on there and lied to the attorneys. And everybody said the case was over. Everybody said that's it. He'll never come out. I said the devil is a liar. Because I know this man, if he did, if he committed the crime, I would have stood with him anyway and said, 38 years is long enough for you to be in there. But I know in my soul, I know from my spirit, he didn't shoot anybody. I did not know what to do. And then I got a scripture that said this, Psalms 3, the fourth, uh, the seventh, hold on, the uh, fifth verse. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your crooked path straight. I knew then that God was still in it. I knew then that my faith should never be in a judicial system. My faith should never be in, a, in another criminal. My faith should never be in somebody else's word. My faith should be in the Lord. What have you gone through this week where you felt your faith might have been shaken? 
Steve, God spoke directly to me. When I wanted to get back, he said, vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. Whatever you're going through, I'm telling you, if you say, if you have the blood of Jesus over you, you're going to go through something. If you don't, I might question, are you really saved or not? Because he said in this world, we will have tribulation. We will have trials. We will have things come against us. But he told us, Jesus said, be of good cheer because I have overcome the world. Now, what made me have my faith again? I saw this couple, I saw this thing on TV where the flood was in Florida. These two grandparents standing on the roof with their baby, their grandbaby. The helicopter saw them, and before they could get them, the roof collapsed, and they all instantly died. So it doesn't mean that God is always going to change everything for us. It doesn't mean that God is a genie in a bottle. What it means is if you trust in the Lord with all of your heart and lean not to your own understanding, God will deliver you. That's my word. God bless you. You know, uh, like I was saying, Brian and the musicians were playing. I felt as if I was sitting at the throne room. And all of you were there with me. And then I turned around and looked at the crowd, and there was a sea of people standing at the throne room, kneeling and worshiping God. At the same time, it was just unbelievable. So I'm... I'm proud that I'm part of that. Besides, the musicians are very good here. They're anointed by God. The Holy Spirit is working with them. Anyway, I was reading in Colossians, and I started taking notes, as if Colossians needed notes. But this is the true purchase, true per of life of the saints and faithful in Christ is to the maintenance of a twofold relationship toward God believe me I'm not sure yet how I figured all this out but um, uh, these are without the first is covered by prayer as it includes Adoration, confession, and petition. This life must be solutionally cultivated. A necessary element in such a life is watchfulness. Yet such watchfulness is not to be categorized by anxiety, for it is to be with thanksgiving cheerfulness is to mingle with cautiousness toward them that are without. The saint is to walk in wisdom. This again is closely linked with the prayer life. Moreover, the speech of the saint is to be categorized by grace and by salt. That is to be continuous and yet by the qualities which prevent corruption. Amen. So that was my uh, bout with uh, Colossians chapter 4. But uh, God is good when he starts talking and starts sharing with you. Amen. And now I'd like to thank God for Pastor Richard. I pray that he uh, the anointing on him uh, Lord, so right now we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for bringing forth your servant to speak to you and to us 
And to all of them that are out there that have an ear that is listening, and we give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, church. Amen. Good morning, FAC. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. So, so good. He is moving. I'll be honest, I was sitting over there in worship, and you guys know, I, I try to prepare my heart and my body and my mind and everything to come up here. And, and I got done reviewing everything I was going to preach on, and I stood up and I said, this seems dead. It's hours of work. I didn't understand it. I was confused because it just didn't make sense. And then Deidre comes over and says, Steve's word is in alignment with my word. And I said, okay, then go ahead, girl. You take it away. And Lloyd had said earlier, I got a word. And, and I'm going to try to help you guys put the puzzle back together here a little bit. We're talking about in... in in Mark chapter 6 today, we're talking about God's provision. But his provision coming through his purpose for our lives. Trust in me, right? And he'll make your path straight. What we're, what we're boiling this all down to is there is a purpose in your life. There is a journey that you are meant to be on. There is an attitude, just as Lloyd shared, there's a posture, an attitude that Christians should have. It should be one in prayer and supplication and joy and grace. He said your word, your word should be full of grace and salt. There, there, there's a posture we should have. We should refine. There's a path we should walk. And when we have the posture and we walk the path that God has straightened out for us, his provision will come. I shouldn't have to say any more, but I did spend some hours on this sermon, so we're going to preach it. Amen, church? Amen. God is alive even when I feel dead. Amen, church? Amen. God is good all and all the time. Good. So good. I want to thank you all last week, too. Um, how many of you were here last week? How many of you stayed till noon? Because Richard is long-winded. I appreciate that so much. Uh, last week, we had our first ever what we called transparency budget meeting. It covered a lot of different things. But I do want to thank Ken and Steve for putting effort and energy into helping prepare that. And I want to thank you guys for being here. Um, what we did last week was cast big vision for this church. Uh, we cast it in the theme of finances, but we know it's so much greater than that. Um, and I want to caution the church a little bit here. Raise your hand, and I really do want you to, to engage with this. Raise your hand if the last seven days you've had a hard time sleeping. Everyone, keep your hands up and everyone look around. The devil is attacking our church. I'm going to say this with confidence. I've had some leadership meetings through the past week in the same theme over and over and over again is that I am exhausted. Church, you don't have to let him have any territory in your life. Church, you can stand up, you can go to your house, and you can pray over that building. You can let the devil know that this house is the house of the Lord because wherever I am, the Holy Spirit is. Wherever the Holy Spirit is, he has authority over that place. Don't get it twisted. Again, God will provide. His provision is real, but we have a posture and an attitude that we must have. So I want to encourage you guys to pray over your kids, to pray over your household, to pray before you sleep that the Lord will give you abundant rest. And that he will, will, will push back the enemy. It says if we resist the devil, he will flee. flee. That's not part of my sermon, but it's a caution. And as your shepherd, I want you guys to be very aware that the devil is attacking this church. He's going after your sleep. He's going after your sin struggles. He's going after those things. So pray up. And if you need extra prayer, please come talk to me or any of your elders. Amen, church? Amen. 
Okay, so today we're going to continue our series, Walk Like Jesus. We're going to be in Mark chapter 6, if you have your Bibles with you. We'll be going through verse 7 through 13, just a small little passage. But today's passage, if you haven't already got it, is really giving us assurance that when we align with God's purpose for our life, we can, we can depend on His provision. So my question for us today, to help us focus our thought a little bit, is what should we carry... While we walk like Jesus. Again, our theme is walking like Jesus. What's the attitude we should have? Well, what should we physically carry? So that's what we will dive into. I'm going to pray because you can never pray enough, and we will read our passage. Heavenly Father, thank you for this church. Lord, I pray right now specifically for a hedge of protection over every single person that calls this church their home, Father. Lord, we are on a journey to make an impact in the city of Ferndale for your kingdom. And we know that the devil does not want that. So, Father, protect us. Give us the tools necessary. Give us the discernment to see the evil one as he prowls around. And let us have the, the willpower and the strength, your willpower and strength, to resist him so that he must flee. Father, we pray that your words only come from this stage, Father, and that you will be glorified in this journey, in this sermon. Again, we give everything over to you. We humbly fall down at our knees before you because we are ready to receive what you have for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. The church said together, amen. amen. So our church recently went camping the first weekend of August. How many of you went camping to the camp out? Okay, a few of you guys. Um, now imagine packing for that trip. How many of you are the packers in your family? How many of you are the husbands like me that don't do any of the packing and just rely on the superstar wife? Me and Russ and Gary, <laughs> Brian, okay, a few of us. Now imagine, okay, you're going to pack for this camp out. It's going to be, you know, four days, three nights. It's going to be a good time. And the only thing you pack is a walking stick. Do you think you'll be prepared for the adventure of FAC Church Camp Out with just a walking stick? It's funny because that's exactly what Jesus tells his disciples to do in this passage. It, 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 it's pretty much right on. They were sent on a mission to go out away from some stability. Okay, they were sent out, and they were told they have to rely on God for everything. You can take your walking stick and the current clothes that you're wearing, but that is all you get. They had to trust. Let's read our passage, Mark 6, 7. It says, Then Jesus went from village to village teaching the people. And he called his 12 disciples, his, his 12 homies, his bros, together, and he began sending them out, not one by one, but two by two, giving them the authority to cast out evil spirits. He told them to take nothing for their journey except a walking stick, no food, no traveler's bag, no money. How many of you guys are the ones like are really bad at packing, and so you just figure, I'm just going to bring the credit card if I forgot something? Okay, nobody, just me. All right. Okay, no money. You can't even bring that. No credit card, no debit card, nothing. He allowed them to wear sandals, but not to take a change of clothes. Jesus said this, wherever you go, stay in the same house until you leave town. But if any place refuses you or refuses to welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust off from your feet as you leave, to show that you have abandoned those people to their fate. You refused, so we move on. So the disciples went out telling everyone they met to repent of their sins and turn to God. And they cast out many demons and healed many sick people, and they anointed them with olive oil. So what's happening in the story is that Jesus He's sending out his 12 disciples to go do the work of the gospel, to proclaim the good news of Jesus. And he does with minimal supplies. And they're able to accomplish great things, profound things, with nothing. They were aligned with God's purpose, and God ensured their provision. So they were sent out. They had to trust that God would provide for them. And this required a lot of faith on their part. What would be your first knee-jerk reaction? Hey, you're going to go to this town a few days away. Um, you're going to have to knock on some doors, some random stranger's doors, and you're going to have to ask them to help provide for your needs. <laughs> 
There's a lot of introverts in here that are saying, just, I would just die. Just let me, I'll just lay on the side of the road. I'm not doing it, you know? But no, they had to have this faith. They had to step out into this, this, this situation of, of discomfort. They couldn't bring anything. They had to rely on God. You know, sometimes I wish I was required to rely on God more often. What I mean by that is, in America, we're pretty comfortable. So we get a headache and we take some Tylenol. We, uh, maybe we lose our job. Well, we just apply for a bunch of other ones, right? We have opportunity and options here. But when you have nothing and God is your only source of reliance, I think it changes, again, our posture. So it's verse 7. He called his 12 disciples together. They began sending them out two by two, giving them authority to cast out evil spirits. He told them to take nothing for the journey except a walking stick, no food, no traveler's bag, no money. He allowed them to wear sandals, but not to take a change of clothes. This is the biblical theme of relying on God. And it's a, it's a biblical thing because it's not just isolated to this one passage. I want you guys to know as Christians, it is part of your DNA that you need to rely on God for, for pretty much everything. Not just your material needs, but your emotional needs, your, your mental needs, right? Your spiritual needs. A lot of times we think of provision as just the physical. We'll get to, the, get to it a little bit later in the message, but it's so much more than that. Reliance on our Father. Matthew 6, 25 says this, Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat, drink, or about your body, or what you will wear. Don't worry about it. <gasps> How many of you are worry warts? <laughs> I want to worry about it, right? Is not life more than food and the body more than clothes? There's more going on here than just the physical Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they, Steve? You are seen. If the birds are seen, by golly, the creature that is made in the likeness and image of, of God is also seen. Amen, church? Can any one of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your life? No, science has proven quite the opposite. Anxiety and worry take away from your life. And why do you worry about clothes? See the flowers of the field. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon, in all of his splendor, very wealthy man, was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today and tomorrow thrown in the fire, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat or what shall we drink or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But instead, seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all of these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough trouble of its own. This is a biblical theme. Reliance and dependence on God. Not chasing after these things, but instead chasing after the kingdom and knowing that the provision comes. Again, Deidre's word, he will make our path straight. There's a direction for our lives. And when we fall in line with that direction and, and, and we just relentlessly pursue what God has purposed for our life, the provision comes. He is a loving father who knows what your needs are. It doesn't say he's going to supply the Ferrari. He can, but it doesn't say that's your need. He takes care of your needs. Philippians 4.19, And my God will supply every need of yours according to his riches and glory. In Christ Jesus. It's again, it's this path. God has provision for us. And when we understand that, when we understand that we can rely on him and he is faithful to follow through, it allows us to take these steps. Imagine walking a beam or a tightrope. That is the path that God has laid out for you. And you're sitting there and you're walking. How much easier... Is it to walk when you know that the beam is only one inch off the ground? That's what it's like to have faith in God's provision. 
I know I'm not perfect. God sees me as perfect because of the work of Jesus Christ. But I'm still being made perfect. I'm still getting, you know, worked on. And you know what? I might walk this beam fixed on him, and I might stumble, but God provides, and he helps correct me. I want to share a cruel, cool, cool testimony that's part of our history here of Ferndale Alliance Church. 1988, John and Diane Mutchler were going to Northwood Alliance Church in Blaine, and they were called to plant a church in Ferndale. So they went, they took a leap of faith. They felt purposed and called. They planted Ferndale Alliance Church, the church that you guys are in attendance, and they met at the Seventh-day Adventist Church down the road there. And after a little bit of time, the individuals that own this church, Bakerview Baptist, they had realized that they were part of a dying congregation. They were aging out. It's a sad reality of a lot of churches, something we're trying to really hard to avoid here, right? We, we want to keep going after the youth, keep going after the youth. We're handing the baton off. We're not hoarding it, right? They realized this. Baker, Baker Baptist realized they were aging out, so they wanted to find a young pastor, and they wanted to give him the keys to this church. So in the early 90s, John and Diane received this church for Ferndale Alliance Church for our body free of charge with no debt. Do you think John and Diane had some crazy, big, real, calculated, strategic plan on how to get a church building for Ferndale Lance Church when they, were, when they were borrowing a church? Not that early on. But they knew they were called to plant a church, and God provided this amazing building. Isn't that a beautiful example of God's provision? And look at us. Over 36 years later, still a church congregation. So stepping out in faith, it, it, it means that we acknowledge that we don't have all the answers. Yeah. It means we acknowledge we don't know how the provision will come. Yeah. But we're going to trust God that his provision will come. Yeah. Ken Ray, one of my great friends, uh, uh, a strong leader in this church, he, uh, he's like one of my sounding boards, if you guys don't know. Um, we spend about, I don't know, too many hours a week um, just talking about the church and, 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 and our love for the church. And uh, one of the things that uh, really started Ken and I's relationship was uh, he invited me sailing. How many of you have been sailing before? So Ken's got this sailboat, and it's, it's a speedy little thing. And we went out to the lake, and, and, and we, we kind of had to plan a couple different days that could work because you can't go sailing if there's no wind. wind. So we finally find a day, and we go out there, and we are really subject to the wind. We can do some things to still move the direction we want to go if we're trying to go against the wind, but it's hard and it's not that fun and it takes a long time. But then every once in a while, you'll get a good gust of wind. And the thing, if you want to go fast when you're sailing, you are subject to the wind. And sure enough, Ken gets us queued up in this space where we can get a good chunk of wind. And I had never been sailing before. And all of a sudden, that wind hits the sails. And it is like, I don't know. I've been in fast cars before. And you know that feeling you get? It's like, oh, it was like that, but on a boat. So you're kind of scared because you might tip and die. But, you know, whatever. <laughs> and so, so, so it just takes you off. And it's just a blast. And you're like, this is amazing. But again, we could only go the direction that the wind was willing to let us go. God has a purpose for you. His purpose will only let you go a certain direction. That's where the provision is. That's where the wind is. The wind is the provision for the sailboat. God has provision in that wind, but it's only if you're going the direction that he wants you to go. Does that make sense, church? God's provision is a beautiful thing, but if you are in direct disobedience to God... Don't count on it. Next little section there in verses 7 and 9. This is a really important part. Uh, Jesus sent his disciples out solo. No, you're listening. He sent them out how? He sent his disciples out two by two. Church, I cannot stress this enough. Stop trying to do ministry. Stop trying to walk with Jesus. Stop trying to evangelize your family alone. 
That's not God's plan. It's not his purpose. Church, we are one body together. Together. When it comes to actually reaching your family, if your family is full of sinners and you don't have another brother or sister in your family that can help minister to them, invite a friend to family dinner. It's not that weird. Have your friend come. Let their action and attitude share the love of Christ towards them. If you're like me, or Ellie and Lake, sorry, I'm going to embarrass you guys a little bit, uh, they play recreational softball with me. We have lots of fun out there. When you're out there and you're doing a recreational sport or you have some hobby that you're doing, great. If you're the only Christian out there, then invite another one to sit on the bleachers and pray for everyone that's playing the game. Find a strategy that allows you to partner with someone so you're both focused on the same mission of evangelizing these people that are lost, that are destined for hell, so that God's kingdom can grow. Partner with it two by two. Look at Jesus. He walked with 12. And then he sent his disciples out two by two. Church, if it was good enough for Jesus, then it's great for us, right? Can we agree? Stop trying to do it alone. If you're the only Christian in your work, bam! So find somebody, partner. Find somebody. Uh, Brian McIntosh and I worked for a company, and we were just a couple Christians. And we ended up getting a group, and we would pray together every Wednesday at work. And then we'd walk around the building, and we would pray over it. By the time we both left there, it was like five of us that would get together and pray for our church, for our company. And I've told you guys this, I've seen more people come to Christ in a machine shop than I have inside of a church. Because that's God's strategy. The church is for equipping the saints to get recharged to go out, right? So that we can do it. But stop doing it alone. Amen, church? Amen. We get confirmation on this in the other gospels account, too. So he sent his disciples out two by two. In Acts 2, we see another example in 44 and 45, where every Christian, it was the early church. So this is a season where really momentum was needed. And so what the church, church did at that time is they shared everything together. People were selling property and giving it in. They were eating meals together, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. They were thriving together. We talk, uh, uh, Paul talks in Philippians chapter 4, too, about how the church supported his ministry needs. Paul, yeah, he was a tent maker. He, he financially supported himself in certain ways, but in a, a lot of other ways, it was the churches that were supporting his ministry. Paul did not go out on mission alone. He always took others with him. So again, the themes that we're looking at here is God's provision. It's there when we're in purpose. Okay? Dependence and reliance on God. That is a major theme of the Bible. It's a Christian theme. It should be in your life. The next one is that you should not do ministry alone. Another brilliant theme. We see it over and over again. You've heard me say this, and I'll say it again. Isolation is the devil's greatest trap. Because if the devil can get you alone, then he can speak to you. He can share things about you. He can start to break you down to feel like you're insufficient. But yet our God says that you are fearfully and wonderfully made, that you're his child, that you've been adopted into his kingdom, that you are set apart. And you need, just like Steve needed on Friday morning, you need others around you to, to remind you of those. Steve was authentic with God. He let it all out. I'm a sinner. I've done this. I've messed up. This is yucky. This is gross. And he needed to do that. But then God, through his wife, through the radio station, which takes people, and through his coworker, was reminded that, no, he is a child of God. So don't do it alone. Amen, church. Amen. Don't do it alone. Amen, church. Amen. Thank you so much. <coughs> One more fun analogy. The, our church potluck. Okay? It's in Soup Sundays in two weeks. It's going to be super fun. That's another one of those things. Imagine if you had to put on the Soup Sunday all by yourself. That would suck. But here we are as a church. We get to do it together, and it is one of the best traditions that we have at this church. Okay, verse 10. Let's continue. Wherever you go, he said, stay in the same house until you leave. So, so get to a town, find a place that welcomes you in, and that's your home base until you leave. Okay? That's the command. But if any place refuses to welcome you or listen to you, shake the dust from your feet as you leave to show that, that you have abandoned these people to their fate. Whew, that's tough, huh? 
uh, this, uh, this, that's this theme of the Bible, <laughs> letting go. How many of us struggle so deeply with the, the, the idea of letting go? But what Jesus is instructing here is so pivotal. And it's even something that he did time and time again. When he tells them to shake the dust off, off their feet as a testimony against those who rejected the message, it's a way for the disciples to say, focus on the mission. Even Jesus, at one point, crowds are gathering around him. And, and they all want healing, which is a good thing. But they weren't there for him. They were there for themselves to receive the healing. And Jesus knew that my mission is not here to heal everybody's physical needs. No, my mission at the end of the day is to proclaim that the Messiah is here, that God has come down to earth, and I'm going to die to set you all free. That was the mission. And so at one point, these crowds are gathering around him, and Jesus, in a sense, abandons them. That's what it looks like. He gets in his boat, and he sails across, and not everyone could follow him. And we might view that as heartless, but was it? Because because of that decision, Jesus was then able to fulfill the mission of dying for everybody. And in the moment, it seems like it's a little painful, but it's, it's not. And it's the same for these, these disciples when they go out. They go to this town. The entire town rejects them. Well, they still preached. They still proclaimed. They still shared the good news of Jesus to this town. They planted a seed, but they decided they didn't want it. So we're going to continue to move on. And I'm going to trust that God is going to make that seed grow. And you know what? I went to this other town. This is the, the process of multiplication. Don't miss this, church. So we rejected this town. We walked away. You were not ready for this gospel. This gospel message is what you need. You don't want it, so we're going on. This town receives them. This town gets evangelized. This town gets set free, and it, it grows. And all of a sudden, the town over here is starting to look at that town. What is going on? And that seed that was planted sprouts, and they start having these conversations. And then all of a sudden, they are open to it. So a lot of times we think rejection is abandoning somebody to their sin to the point where we're just going to let them go to hell. But that is not the case. The case is that you have a mission. And when you accomplish the mission, multiplication happens. And then what you might have rejected could soon come to fruition into a beautiful, beautiful tree. Do you see it? So just because we let people go, just because we walk away does not mean we're evil or wicked. It means that we have another mission and we're trusting that person to the Lord. I love that Jesus was really clear in this section. If they reject you, don't sit there and try a new strategy. Don't sit there and try to get all creative and cutesy with them. Just move on. You preach the gospel. They rejected you. Move on. It was really clear. Their mission was clear. How many of you wish you got a clear mission from the Lord? with your purpose. Everyone's like, I just wish God would tell me what to do. Richard, you're saying that if I follow God's purpose for my life, that his provision comes, well, I want that, but I don't know what his purpose is. To that I say Isaiah 43, 7. It says, bring all who claim me as their God, for I have made them for what? For my glory. At the foundation of your purpose, is to glorify God, to bring God glory. But how do we do that? Matthew 28, 19, it's called the Great Commission. We're part of the Christian and Missionary Alliance. This is our verse. If you don't know it, church, read it, Matthew 28. The whole thing is beautiful. But 19, it says, Therefore go and make disciples among all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them everything I've taught you. That's your mission. Okay? So our purpose is to bring glory to God. We accomplish that by making disciples, by helping people see the truth. And how do we accomplish that? Right here, Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37. We accomplish making disciples by doing these two things, the two greatest commandments, which is to love your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. And the second is like this, love your neighbor as you love yourself. 
So let me share this with you. I'm giving you your purpose as a Christian. Your purpose is to glorify God by making disciples. And you make disciples by radically loving Jesus and radically loving your neighbor. When you do those things, it comes to fruition. The details are different for each person. There's the specifics. But if you truly love your God and you're in communion with him, just like Steve was Friday morning, and you're authentic with him, he will make your path straight if you trust in him. And that's where the provision comes. So church, it is our mission. Glorify God, make disciples, love him and love each other. What is our vision here at Ferndale Alliance Church? It's to be simply healthy, which means that every ministry will do two things. Glorify God and edify or strengthen the church. We accomplish this by being authentic with Jesus and each other. We accomplish this by loving Jesus and each other. Do you see it, church? Am I confusing anybody? Good. So, pursue him, even in the face of, face of rejection. Don't be afraid to let things go and move past so that you can accomplish the greater mission. For all my video game nerds in here, which I know is a limited group, there was a game created called Elden Ring. In this game, it is meant to be very difficult. You start the game, and you come out of this little tomb, and you like got swords, and you fight stuff, okay? So you come out of this little area, and you walk into this huge open world, and it's beautiful. The technology is just crazy. And you take your first step out onto this balcony, and there's what's called a tree sitting on in front of you. Tree sitting on, okay? It's an armored up dude on a horse. And so natural intuition for a video gamer is that's a bad guy, I'm going to go fight him. If you've played the game, you will realize that if your first action is to go and fight this thing, you will be met with imminent death. You will die pretty much instantly. The thing is actually designed to kind of be a little bit of a tease, that this game you're embarking on is very hard. The purpose of this creature is to actually not engage it. It's to face it, get rejected, shake off the dust, and move on so that you can progress in the game and come back later. That is what is happening here when Jesus says, kick off the dust. You will face things. You will probably get smacked around a little bit. Shake it off and move on. It is hard, church. There's a young man. I considered him a brother, young man, who I held on to, and I held on to. And I held on to, and I got hurt, and I got hurt, and I got hurt, and I had, whew, I had to let go. I still have no clue where this man is. I don't know if he's dead. He could have ended up in a ditch somewhere. I have no clue. But I had to let him go because of how much effort and energy I was putting into this man's life. I was not able to accomplish the mission that God had. And I had to tell him, I can no longer support you. You can no longer sleep on my couch. I can't be there for you. You need to go figure it out. It hurts, church. I know what I'm telling you to do can hurt. But I promise that we just need to trust God. I promise if we trust God, he will provide. So Jesus gives the instructions to shake off the dust. Paul says this in Acts 18. It says he shakes off his garment after he was opposed, kind of showing that similar thing. Sometimes we do just got to let it go. Okay, last section of scripture, and we'll conclude. Verse 12, it says, So the disciples went out, telling everyone that they met to repent of their sins and turn to God. And they cast out many demons and healed many sick people, anointing them with olive oil. So Jesus, when he sent them out, he gave them authority and power. Profound authority and power, actually, to cast out demons and heal the sick. It wasn't just about them going out and preaching the gospel, but it was also about demonstrating God's power. That God's provision, and I said this earlier, but God's provision goes beyond just our material needs. God's provision actually includes our spiritual needs as well. Acts 1.8, this was after um, Jesus was resurrected. 
And uh, he says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. It's interesting that Jesus, who just was resurrected from the dead, profound experience, says, it's actually better for you all, the disciples and us, that I leave so that I can send my helper, the Holy Spirit, to you. So profound. And it shows the power of the Holy Spirit. It shows that he has provided everything we need. As I mentioned earlier, we, are in the, we have a demonic battle we're fighting at this church. God has provided us the Holy Spirit to fight that. His provision goes beyond just our needs. James chapter 5, it's a... Uh, in verse 14, it's one of my, my like life verses for Christian leadership um, and fighting anxiety or depression. If you haven't read it, read it. But it says, is anyone among you sick or is anyone among you troubled to call forth the elders so they can pray over you and anoint you with oil? And the prayers of a righteous person are effective. And it's just, again, the reminder that God has given us what we need, not just for our physical needs, but also for the spiritual battles that we face. God's provision is greater than just our needs. Uh, it's kind of like, um, let me see. I think I just got Doug in my head right now. Um, Doug is a handyman, if you guys don't know Doug. Uh, you use power tools. You have a, uh, he's working on this project, it's beautiful. Um, he's making, <laughs> you're 80, 80? 80 period. period. He said, don't add any more to that. <laughs> Doug? Doug is 80 years old and he's, he is obsessed with learning. So what would any normal 80-year-old do um, but try to learn how to make stained glass, which is a trade that people spend decades on to master. So Doug is making stained glass windows, and there, he's got this first one done, and it's beautiful. Um, in order to make some of these sharper angles, he has to have a, a it's like this diamond cutting table. I don't know what else to call it. Okay, you guys are tracking here. He cuts glass. It's real fancy, and he has this diamond abrasive thing. Now, if he didn't have it plugged in, he would have to take his glass and actuate it, right, in order to cut the glass. It wouldn't work. The tool still works, kind of, but not the way it's meant. It's not until he plugs it into a source of electricity that it spins, right? And then he's able to do the work. That's how God's provision spiritually works. Like, we, we can have some practical tools, and we might be able to get through our lives, but we will make no impact unless we're plugged in to the source. That is the Holy Spirit. He is the source of our power. It is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. And his provision carries me through. So let's recap here. When we align with God's purpose, the tightrope, the straight path, God will bring the provision that we need to fulfill that purpose. He's in it. He's bought into it. Okay? He equips those that are willing to step out in faith. And depend on him. He, is, he, he wants us to do it in partnership with each other. We didn't touch on this, but when the disciples went to other towns, they were going together, but they also had to rely on another person. Like God convicted that person to open up their home to provide for their needs. Like God wants us to partner with each other, to provide for each other's needs. He clarifies our mission, and he empowers us with the spiritual authority to actually walk the walk. So I started the question, what should we carry while walking with Jesus? The disciples were told to carry a stick. Church, I want to instruct you, when you walk with Jesus, carry the confidence and faith that God is faithful. You don't have to stress about all the needs. Be smart. Don't be reckless. Don't be stupid, okay? God gave you a brain, okay? But don't stress and worry about the little details. Let him work that out. You walk the path that you are called to walk. Glorify God. Make disciples. Love him with everything you've got. And love each other as you love yourself. So where is God calling you to step out in faith? How can you trust him to provide for that purpose? 
And if you feel like God is calling you to take the step of faith, trust me, it's worth it. Because at 24 years old, I was called to be a pastor. And at 34 years old, it happened. It was a 10-year journey for me. It takes time, but I feel so blessed to be where I am. It's worth the journey. Amen, church? Amen. Worship team, you can start coming back up, and we will pray and conclude with a, one of my favorite songs that we sing here. So, dearly, Father, I thank you for all that you provide. Father, I thank you that you are a good and loving God. Father, I thank you just for the freedom that we have in you. I do want to continue to pray against the devil and all that he's trying to mingle with. Father, we resist him, and he will have to flee. Father, I pray that this church will continue to be a church that seeps out into the community, that starts to knock on our neighbor's doors, that just like the disciples, goes from house to house, letting them know the gospel. And if they reject us, that's fine. We keep moving because we have a greater purpose, Father. We know it's October, but I still want to keep praying for 125 by 2025, Father. I want to pray that this body becomes so full of life and so full of bodies that people start to recognize that God is moving in this church and that you draw them in, Father, with your aroma, not ours, but with yours, and that we can start being a church that helps break the shackles of sin in this community. Again, we thank you for what you're doing. We pray this in Jesus' name. The church said together, amen. amen. Your love is like radiant time on bursting inside us. We cannot contain your love will surely come find us like blazing wildfires. Singing your name, God of mercy, sweet love of mine, I have surrendered to your design. May this offering stretch across the sky. These hallelujahs be multiplied. These hallelujahs be Your love is like radiant diamonds bursting inside us. We cannot contain. Your love will surely confine us like blazing wildfires. Sing in your name, God of mercy, sweet love of mine, I have surrendered to your design. May this offering stretch across. Oh, 
surrender to your design, right? I made this offering. Have you surrendered to his design? Does God have a plan or purpose for your life that you're not following? If so, it's time to follow, and I promise it'll be worth it. Amen, church? Amen. You're dismissed. Love y'all. Remember, Soup Sunday in two weeks. Great time to invite your friends. God bless y'all.